This is the Atlantic Ocean, home to hundreds of thousands of species, including the North Atlantic right whale. Also beneath the surface is fishing gear, a potential threat to the majestic creatures below. This is a humane and moral issue, and we can't just ignore it. But take away the fishing gear and New England's fishing industry takes a major blow. Who can think of Maine without thinking lobster? It's, it's everything. We need to find a solution that will allow the fishermen to continue to fish and allow whales to not suffer. Salty sea air. All right, one, two, three. All set. You guys can head right on in. The freedom of the open water. We're, we're doing what's always been part of active whale research on these boats. Or just the excitement of seeing a whale up close. Whale watching tours are packed up and down the Atlantic coast day after day. We want to be good to the whales. Our goal is to go out there and visit with them, to spend time with them, to see what they're doing, to see them in their world. Wonderful light, opportunity uh, for if you will. See, I mean, you get so excited when you see them. It's just fabulous. I wish everybody could see them and understand why we need to protect them. Miles off the shores of Maine, this is what you'll see. Humpback whales, finbacks, minkies, dolphins, birds. Less common nowadays is spotting a North Atlantic right whale, an endangered species since 1973. The North Atlantic right whale sits in the spotlight of conservation efforts with a population hovering at about 360. Take a breath and realize that half of the air you just breathed came from the ocean. So it's not so much about saving whales, it's about saving the ocean and being a responsible steward to what goes on in the ocean. Sean Todd is the director of Allied Whale, a marine mammal research program in the Gulf of Maine. The reason why we have so few whales on this planet now is because frankly we slaughtered them back in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, we caused that problem. This was a dead humpback whale found in Acadia National Park right off Great Head Trail. The nonprofit documents whale patterns from populations to migration patterns to their causes of death. That scarring is distinctive of an entanglement. And we know that she was entangled in fishing gear a few times in her life. Back at the dock, naturalists like Zach Cliver say they've seen the issue of whale entanglement firsthand. I worked as a whale watch naturalist for 31 years, and I led over 3,000 whale watching trips on the Gulf of Maine. I also saw whales entangled in lobster fishing gear off the coast of Maine. And um, I've seen a lot of right whales off the coast of Maine in the same area as lobster fishing gear. So I know there's a, a lot of co-occurrence and it's a risk. How does whale entanglement happen for someone who has never seen it before? So if, you know, if you're a whale swimming naturally in the water uh, uh, and you come across a rope, you, you might not necessarily understand what a rope is. We think in a number of cases, the whale tends to panic. In that panicking, it creates, it rolls, and then you get further wraps around the animal. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, plays a big role in keeping track of entanglements. A 2017 report shows 76 confirmed cases of whale entanglements on U.S. coasts. In 70% of the cases, whales were entangled in fishing gear. 33 of the 76 were in the Northeast Mid-Atlantic region. Sean says more concerning are the entanglements that aren't recorded. When we look at statistics on entanglements and ship strikes, do you think those are accurate or just potentially guesses? I think they are absolutely underestimates in all cases because you know, you're not gonna be able to see everything. It is a huge ocean out there. We're not seeing the whales that die and sink 
or the whales that die and just float off into the middle of the ocean and eventually decompose. We're not seeing any of that. We're only seeing the animals that specifically get entangled and wash up on our shores. Since 2017, there have been 14 cases of right whales being seriously injured by entanglements. Thousands and thousands of end lines out there in the area where the whales are, um, of course, it, there, there's a huge risk. So who's to blame? It's hard to say and even more difficult to trace. Most entanglements don't leave any gear that can be um, analyzed to the point of its origin. You know that if you have a lot of gear in one area and there are whales in the area and we know those two things are true, then entanglements must be happening. The coasts of Maine are filled with thousands of vertical lines used to attach buoys on the surface to lobster traps below, an industry that fuels the economies of many states in the Northeast. I recognize the lobster fishery as being culturally incredibly important and economically incredibly important to the state. But um, I am also very interested in helping fishermen become stewards of the problem. Coming up, the future is uncertain for Maine's multi-million dollar lobster industry. Why the impact goes beyond what's happening out in the water. result of a long day's work for Chris Welsh and his crew. Hundreds of lobsters, all pulled from their traps off the coast of Maine. It's how Chris has made a living for nearly two decades. I started lobstering with my grandfather when I was about six years old. When I turned about 14, I bought my first boat. And then when I was a senior in high school, he got diagnosed with can terminal cancer. So I bought his business out. In a way, this industry is unique. Long days on the open water, bringing back a product that is caught and delivered live the very same day. It's a business, but it's honestly, it's a way of life. Patrice McCarran is the Maine Lobstermen's Association Executive Director. She helps advocate for these businesses. The lobster fishery is the reason why many kids stay in Maine. It's how we keep our islands and our coastal communities going. It is the foundation of almost every coastal economy up the coast of Maine. The future of how it operates is uncertain. With concerns about the population of the North Atlantic right whale and entanglements, the federal government is expected to release new regulations to help combat population decline. NOAA released a biological opinion in May, giving lobstermen an idea of the rules being considered, from seasonal fishing closures to the use of weaker ropes that snap when whales encounter them. What are the association's thoughts on NOAA's biological opinion? On the one hand, we're very glad that the agency found that permitting our fishery will not jeopardize the survival of right whales. But that finding comes with a 10-year conservation plan. In over 10 years, they want us to reduce our risk by 98%. That could mean 98% less vertical line in the water, which is the rope that connects buoys on the surface to the lobster traps on the ocean floor. So the question is, what form of the main lobster fishery could possibly exist with a 98% risk reduction? We are a fleet of over 4,500 vessels. A statement sent to us from NOAA says, in part, the conservation framework outlines our commitment to implement measures that are necessary for the survival and recovery of right whales, while providing a phased, adaptive management approach and flexibility to the fishing industry. The impact goes beyond what's happening out on the water. It also affects the bait dealers, the fuel trucks, the box people, the uh, ice people, 
the packing material. So for Maine lobstermen, it's not just the fishermen, it's the whole community. A big change in the industry could mean new challenges for Steve Kingston. We just uh, specialize in real good quality fried seafood and um, lobster rolls. Why is the lobster industry important for Maine? There's a lot of people who benefit from this industry, especially the culinary world. It's an amazing uh, protein. People love it. In the last few years, um, the lobster roll itself has become a little rock star in the food world. Over the years, lobster rolls have become their big seller. When I first bought it in 2000, sales of this thing may have been less than 10%, and now it's over 50%. Prices for lobster across the U.S. could also change. I do think that if the harder and harder it is on the, re on, the, on, the, on the men and women who fish this, and then the more expensive it's going to become, it could get out of touch with, with, with uh, the public. Um, it's an expensive protein, and we're even seeing it this year. Um, for, this, is, this is the most expensive either clams and or lobster have ever been. Maine's lobster fishery is worth more than $484 million a year. Now they're waiting to hear what's next. Details from the federal government are expected by the end of summer. With what's coming down the pike towards us, we don't really know what's going to happen. I don't know what I would do dif differently that I would enjoy as much as I do this. We all love the ocean and everything about it, and, and we'd be the first to remedy, remedy it if we, we were catching whales. They want, they want to take all the end lines out of the water in the next next decade, I guess. But, I mean, the way we fish around here without having end lines, buoys and end lines, I just don't see how it could ever work. Their entire livelihood depends on a healthy marine environment. The industry is looking for solutions to keep lobster traps in the water and lobster deliveries flowing. A good idea that we'll be adding more traps on each end line to take rope out of the water and the rope that's left in the water will be weakening it. We have to address it. We need to find a solution that will allow the fishermen to continue to fish and allow whales to not suffer. Coming up, a high-tech solution, the new fishing technology that could be the end to whale entanglements and a way to keep fishermen on the water year-round. Martin knows the waters of Cape Cod Bay in Massachusetts like the back of his hand. How many years have you been doing this? Um, 41 years now. Steering his boat with his feet, Rob goes out and collects lobster. That's how he makes a living. I usually get up between 2 and 2.30 in the morning. When it's good, it's good, and when it's bad, it's bad. A few years ago, his operation was disrupted. Massachusetts put a fishing closure in place from February to April due to the number of North Atlantic right whales that migrate through the area. When we got closed, it kind of woke a bunch of us up because we never thought it was going to happen to be that severe. We tried to get back fishing. Like I said, I fished 12 months. That was 100% of my income was lobstering. Enclosures only seem to get bigger. They never seem to go away or shrink. If you get shut down, you're going to figure out how to make it work. So that's exactly what Rob did. I'm setting a line out, and when the last trap goes off, I'm going to hit finish. Rob is helping test ropeless fishing gear. 
solution that involves no vertical line in the water, but a little more technology. And this is my line right here. I'm just going to hit update. These have about uh, a thousand meter range. Kevin Rand with the nonprofit Smelts is here to help. I work with fishermen, support them, getting the gear into the fisheries. Why is ropeless fishing important? One is to end entanglement of marine life, and the other one is to um, get the fishermen back fishing in areas that have been closed due to you know, endangered species such as the North Atlantic right whale. This is how it works. So the transducer is in the water. There is an acoustic single, signal being sent. And then I'm going to trigger it to inflate. The buoy is then released to the surface on command, and Rob can pull up the rest of the traps on the seafloor up from there. Smelts isn't the only company involved in developing ropeless fishing gear. And these are some of the acoustic releases that have been built up, and they'll be mounted in these cages. This is EdgeTech, an underwater technology company that makes acoustic releases. This is our ropeless fishing system. It consists of an acoustic release, which you see right here, um, a release link that holds this top cover on. So this is the first thing that comes up when Lobsman pulls this buoy system. So when we send the acoustic release, the release turns a shaft that unscrews this link. Then the cover comes off with a rope to the surface. Everything can be tracked using an app. And this cage is attached to the rest of the uh, lobster traps that are on his trawl. It could be a half a mile or a mile long trawl of you know 50 lobster traps. So I just hit recover, and that's the coded message you're hearing. That message tells the buoy to come up to the surface. A system like this starts at a few thousand dollars. For comparison, a regular lobster trap starts at a couple hundred. One of the cons that people bring up a lot is the cost. Yeah. Is there a way that you guys are planning on maybe making it a little bit cheaper? Or? We're always trying to make it less expensive. It has to be produced on a, on a scale that will bring the price down, but we're up to the challenge. <laughs> Funding is going to come from government, NGOs, other groups that want to see ropeless fishing. Selling the devices in scale may not happen immediately. Right now, I think it's just going to be for the closures you know, it, in the short term. Closures are something Maine lobstermen could face, but ropeless isn't the first choice for many of them. Ropeless fishing has been fairly controversial because it's a very high-tech solution for an industry that's actually been traditionally, by choice, very low-tech. Patrice McCarran with the Maine Lobstermen's Association says it's not completely out of the realm of possibility, depending on when and where the whales decide to migrate. The Maine Lobstermen's Association views ropeless gear as a very strong solution where there are large aggregations of whales and fishermen who are losing opportunity to fish. So the majority of our fishermen, 80% of Maine lobstermen, fish within three miles of the coast. And, you know, throughout history, there have been few whale sightings. And in the last 10 years, there have been even fewer. So I think ropeless fishing is not the right choice for Maine right now. While ropeless gear is still being tested, conservationalist Sean Todd says we haven't seen its full potential. You think about how cell phones have developed so amazingly over the past 10 years. Well, I'm expecting the same thing in this technology. You know, it just, it just needs some investment, it needs R&D, uh, and it needs the fishermen to, to buy in as an industry. Demonstrating what's possible. This is only going to work if they get a chance to work with the gear. With new federal regulations on the horizon, advocates share what ropeless fishing has to offer. Back in Maine, Zach Cliver, an advocate for ropeless fishing gear, is trying to get the technology into the hands of Maine lobstermen. 
The solution to whale entanglement is closures. The solution to closures that don't allow fishermen to put vertical lines in there is ropeless fishing. Today he is working with scientists and ropeless gear organizations testing ropeless on a research vessel he chartered in Bar Harbor. The demonstration is to help community members understand how it works. I see ropeless as an opportunity to evolve the fishery toward being sustainable. This is sending a signal from the top down to the bottom now. As ropeless fishing is implemented, Zach also sees the rough waters ahead. We're going to have to subsidize this to help the fishermen afford uh, this. But right now, we're at a point where we're just trying offshore to see if we can start with some fishermen to test it and see if this can be part of the solution. Part of the solution for a very complex issue. We're not saying the whole fishery needs to go to ropeless fishing gear to save whales. We're saying let's just see if we can use technology to be part of the solution. Whether the end result is fishing closures, weak rope, ropeless technology, or a combination, the solution is up in the air. We simply don't know what will be required of us, but 98% um, risk reduction seems very unachievable. Um, and we'll require a new business plan, a new operational plan, and we really wonder if we're still gonna have a fishery if all of that goes through. The future of the endangered species, the lobster industry, and the ecosystems that depend on them hinge on new regulations coming from the federal government. I am expecting because, because the federal government is trying to create the best situation possible for everyone that no one will be happy with it. No matter where we land with these whale rules, you know, we are doing our best to do the right thing and, and, and do right by the species and by the ocean. Because what happens here in New England could set an example for other areas around the world. It's not just an issue here, it's a global issue with marine mammals being entangled in fishing gear. We can do something to solve that. That would be the ultimate goal. I would love to see a sea change in attitude whereby the fishermen become the saviors. In New England with photojournalist Drew Snadecki, I'm Chloe Nordquist reporting.